Okay. So um, I'm Thomas Prado. I'm a philosopher of science at uh, CNRS and the University of Bordeaux here in France. And we're starting today a new series of the Philosophy in Biology and Medicine seminars. Um, as many of you know, the Philosophy in Biology and Medicine Network aims at promoting fruitful collaborations between biologists, medical doctors, and philosophers, and also at encouraging conceptual and theoretical work, and more generally, the investigation of deep foundational questions in the biological and biomedical sciences. This is a great honor that Professor Nicole King agreed to give the first talk of this new academic year. Um, Professor King is an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor of genetics, genomics, and development at the University of California, Berkeley in the US. Um, Professor King received her BS from Indiana University uh, in the lab of Tom Kaufman, uh, where she worked on Drosophila. She did her graduate work at Harvard and got her PhD in 1999. Then she was a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And in 2003, she accepted the position of Assistant Professor of Genetics and Development at the University of California, Berkeley. And since then, she has become a full professor and, as I said before, an investigator. Uh, Professor King is a world-leading expert on coenoflagellates. Uh, she investigates deep issues, including the origins of multicellularity and the origins of animal multicellularity. She showed that coenoflagellates, as a sister group of metazoans, could shed a new and fascinating light on metazoans, what is unique to them, what is not unique to them. For, in for instance, she showed with her team that cadherins, one of the most abundant and important cell gene molecules in the animal kingdom, exist in coenoflagellates. Um, today, I thought that Professor King would talk about the origins of multicellularity, but she informed me earlier today that the talk would in fact be on the regulation and evolution of mating, which she said is the most exciting topic in her, li in her lab right now. And I thought it was absolutely great to see what was going on right now in the lab. So the talk is entitled, Why are Coenoflagellates so rarely in the mood? Which I thought is a great title. Um, so we are delighted to have you today, Professor King. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you for being willing to uh, have me switch the focus. I think it's always uh, more fun to talk about what's most exciting and new. Um, I believe everything that I'll be telling you about today is unpublished. Uh, um, what, we're always happy for everything to be shared openly, but I just thought I would tell you that in terms of uh, that it's, some of it is fresh and a little rough around the edges, and hopefully that will be uh, exciting. So, um, so I'm going to tell you about um, you know, what seems to be a repeated theme in the lab, which is that we think we're studying one thing and we discover that we're studying something altogether different. And uh, the study I'm going to tell you about today is particularly interesting for those of you who are, uh, are curious about the origin of animals. And that's because one of the questions that many of us have is when animals first evolved, how did they start uh, differentiating different cell types? And one of the hypotheses about that is that one of the earliest uh, uh, differentiation events was the differentiation between germline and soma. And so with that as the context, I'm gonna tell you about why coanoflagellates are so rarely in the mood. Um, okay, so to get started, I wanna tell you about um, sort of the overall context of the work that we do in my lab. Now, you know, when I started uh, my laboratory, the, one of the things that fascinated me was just how incredibly diverse animals are. Animals can, uh, they can fly, they can swim, some of them are carnivores, of course, others are, um, are filter feeders like the sponge in the right-hand corner. Um, and they are just beautiful to look at. But I think one thing that we often lose sight of is the fact that all animals, despite their uh, incredible diversity, in fact, evolve from a single-celled ancestor. And one of the major motivating questions in my laboratory has been to understand how animals evolved from their single-celled ancestors. And so we think about all of animal diversity as sort of recent innovation and, 
And what we're particularly interested in these early stages, how did uh, single celled organisms give rise to simple colonies? And how did processes of cell differentiation and coordinated function first arise? So to start to reconstruct how animals first evolved, we focus on a, a group of organisms called the coanoflagellates. These are interesting for many reasons that I'm about to tell you about. The first of which is simply the fact that coanoflagellates are the closest living relatives of animals. And so in this simple uh, tree, what I hope you can see are the animals on the right highlighted in purple. And if we compare diverse animals with each other, everything from sponges to diverse bilaterians and beyond, um, we can start to see what was present in their last common ancestor, the Ur-Metazoan. And we can take the same uh, approach in coanoflagellates. And, and I wanna make clear that we actually think that coanoflagellates are as genetically diverse as all animals. And if we compare coanoflagellates to each other and we identify features that they share in common, we can infer that those were present in their last common ancestor. And so by iterating on this type of approach, we can start to understand the nature of the organism from which coanoflagellates and animals first evolved and we can start to think about what might have changed along the stem lineage leading to the ormetazoan. I, I should ask, can you see the pointer um, that I'm using? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so, um, so there's a, a phylogenetic argument to be made for studying coanoflagellates if you're interested in animal origins. Um, but they're also fascinating organisms in and of themselves. And this was something I didn't fully appreciate when I started my lab, but it's become, it's really uh, the, the fascination of their biology, I think, has started to dominate the research um, that we do. And so I want to introduce you to them as living organisms as well. So this is a, a coanoflagellate. Um, it has a five to 10 uh, micron cell body an actin-filled collar of microvilli. These are little tentacles that project from the apical uh, uh, surface of the cell, and then a long flagellum. And the name for coanoflagellate is derived from coano, which uh, relates to the collar. So this, this form of the coanoflagellate is actually intimately tied with its function. And so here, what you can see is a um, we've used a high-speed camera to take footage of a coanoflagellate beating its flagellum and then slowed it down. What I hope you can see is this undulating flagellum and what this uh, inside of the collar, and what this does is it actually pulls water up against the collar. So the coanoflagellate is creating eddies against the collar and these eddies then allow it to pull bacteria in from the, the water column. So coanoflagellates really are bacteria eating machines. They're, they're either swimming around or they're attached to surfaces, they're beating their flagellum and they're pulling bacteria into the collar. So, um, so they have this interesting you know, phylogenetic position close to animals. They have this interesting uh, um, connection between form and function in which they're using the flagellum and the collar to capture bacteria and make a living. And, it, and we're um, increasingly becoming aware of the important role that coanoflagellates play in global ecosystems, in, in particular in carbon transfer. So, um, so we've become fascinated by coanoflagellates um, and we've started developing a coanoflagellate as what, what we're calling a, a model system. Um, and so this is the coanoflagellate that we've actually spent the most time studying. This is the coanoflagellate S. rosetta. And it um, really grabbed my attention when I was first starting out because it forms these beautiful rosette colonies. These are small spheres of cells. Uh, they resemble um, early stages of animal embryogenesis. And I think one of the most exciting things in the context of animal origins and interest in multicellularity is that they undergo this transition from being single cell to multicellular in the laboratory um, uh, as part of their natural life history. And so what we've learned is that these rosettes, far from being uh, something where cells are swimming around and they come together, this is actually a developmental process in which cells reproducibly divide along the apical basal axis. Um, those cells divide and stay together. And then after serial rounds of cell division, they give rise to um, a three-dimensional rosette colony. And so here on the right, you can see one of these founding cells that's undergoing multiple rounds of division. 
but the cells remain attached and this allows them to form this sphere. And I think one of the things that this brings home to me is the fact that in the multicellularity isn't that hard. You know, really it's, um, uh, it's just an iteration or a, a, a variation on this theme of cell division with the cells, instead of breaking apart entirely, they stay attached. Um, so we were very interested, just as a developmental biologist might be interested in understanding how animals develop or plants develop, you know, what are, what are the uh, triggers that cause them to go from this, you know, zygote stage to this multicellular stage? We were interested in this process in the context of the coenoflagellate. We wanted to know, how do they go from being single cell to multicellular? And this is actually not just a um, you know, an abstract interest. It was a, it was a real challenge because in the laboratory they weren't forming rosettes very well, even though they, we knew that they could form rosettes in the laboratory. And so through a series of serendipitous observations, we discovered that the switch from being single cell to multicellular could be triggered by the presence of a particular bacterium. This is a bacterium from the genus Algorophagus. And this alone was sufficient to drive this transition. And in fact, we have found um, no other situation in which they are triggered. Ah, I take that back. Um, David Booth has. But in every case, um, the transition from being single celled to multicellular is triggered by cues from other organisms, primarily from bacteria. Um, but David Booth at UCSF has recently discovered that they can actually also be triggered to undergo this transition um, from, um, through cues that they get from uh, algae. And so we were really fascinated by this interaction. And, and this is a wonderful system on which to study this interaction between a eukaryote and a bacterium because we can grow each of these partners alone or together. And we can, uh, uh, both of them have genetics and both of them also have biochemistry. And so it's a really wonderful collaboration with a natural products chemist at Harvard Medical School, John Clardy. We were able to identify the activity that was present in the bacteria that triggered this transition. And it was actually a small molecule, a lipid, uh, that we've named rosette-inducing factor one or RIF1. And this is a member of a, a novel class of signaling molecules that are related to sphingolipids. And you don't need to uh, worry about the specifics here, but just um, keep in mind that we've been very curious about this molecule and trying to understand how coenoflagellates uh, sense and respond to it. Okay, so that was the first example we found of um, environmental cues governing coenoflagellate developmental history. And, and I wanna take you very quickly through a few other um, examples uh, so that uh, you, you get a better sense of the context of coenoflagellate biology. Mm -hmm. So this coenoflagellate, S. rosetta, and, um, and all other coenoflagellates that we've um, observed has an important part of its life history that is single-celled. And some of them we only observe in the single-celled stage, but many can transition into other life history stages. And, and so I'm gonna, just gonna focus on S. rosetta for the time being. So S. rosetta can switch from being single-celled to uh, colonial, as I told you, or, or forming these rosettes. And this is driven by cues from bacteria, the bacterial sulfonolipids. Um, Thibaut Brunet, who's also in the audience here, showed that um, under confinement, uh, these flagellated coenoflagellate cells can transition into amoeboid cell. Um, and this is a completely different form. And we've also found that uh, this flagellated coenoflagellate form can transition from an asexual state into a mating state under the uh, exposure to either low nutrients or a bacterial cue called eros. And I'm going to walk you through that uh, a little bit more in a moment. Okay. So, um, so what, what a former graduate student in the lab, Tara Levin, found was that coenoflagellates, which we thought were strictly asexual, could actually transition from this uh, seemingly default asexual state into a mating state um, under starvation. And so this is an example of what you see when coenoflagellate cells are starved. They undergo a morphological transition, it seems, where they go from being kind of fat and happy like the other coenoflagellate cells that I showed you into these elongated 
skinny, unhappy looking cells. Some are much smaller, some are longer. We have a few that are maintain somewhat of a rounder state, but you definitely see this transition in shape. And, but this, you know, you can look at these cells and not really know what's going on. Um, it was only uh, through very, very careful observation that Tara realized that in some cases, small cells were fusing with large cells. And progressively, she realized that this was in fact mating. And so we've named these smaller cells, the male gametes and the larger cells, the female gametes. And so if you look very closely, you can actually watch this process in which the male gamete encounters the female gamete and they fuse. And it's always through this fusion near the collar. Okay, so, so that's another example of this environmental condition that nutri nutrient availability can induce mating. Um, uh, not too long after that, another graduate student was studying um, the interactions of diverse bacteria with S. rosetta and she found that a different bacterial species, Vibrio fischeri, did something very strange uh, to S. rosetta, and we weren't sure how to interpret it. And so this is what she saw. On the left are these control cells now being fed plenty of food. Uh, but um, when, when she added Vibrio fischeri, what she saw is that they transitioned from being uh, kind of isolated to actually forming these large clumps. And what she discovered was that this clumping behavior, we, you know, we weren't even sure it was biologically relevant, but she looked carefully and realized that Vibrio fischeri was not just inducing clumping, but it was also inducing cell and nuclear fusion. And so here you can see two cells with their nuclei stained, um, and they're encountering each other, this time not at the collar, but actually at the base of the cells. These cells fuse their membranes, the nuclei mi migrate together and these fuse, and this cell will go on to undergo meiosis and produce haploid progeny, haploid meaning um, uh, a single copy of the nucleus. And we know that in, uh, in all other eukaryotes, when there is mating, there's genetic exchange, there's recombination. And so she went on to ask whether that was the case in this study. And so what she, how she did that was to take um, two different bacterial strains here called R plus and R minus, and they differed at known locations. So we, uh, we had genetic signatures of each of these two strains. Um, and you're just seeing a few examples here at different points on this chromosome. And what she found is that when she added control bacteria versus Vibrio fischeri, she got very different results. So when she added control bacteria that didn't induce mating, all of the progeny of this culture um, had the exact same genotypes as the parents. But when she added Vibrio fischeri, she recovered many haploid progeny that showed evidence of recombination between the genetic information of the parents. And so sure enough, the phenomenon that I just showed you in which Vibrio induces mating also results or induces cell fusion also induces genetic mm -hmm. exchange. So, um, so where this leads us is to this, um, this idea that S. rosetta can undergo and tends to undergo asexual reproduction primarily under normal laboratory conditions, rich media, um, you know, many diverse bacteria, but not those, uh, not Vibrio. But S. rosetta can be induced to mate through two completely different pathways, both of which involve initially a swarming and aggregation stage. But in the case of, um, of starvation, these cells undergo what's called anisogamy. They produce two differentiated cell types. These can fuse, um, as I told you, at the collar. And then these fused cells form a zygote that through a process of uh, meiosis will return us back to the haploid state up here. And in the case of Vibrio fischeri, there's a swarming state, but they actually fuse at the base of the cells. Um, and, uh, and this fusion also eventually leads to zygote formation and the return to asexual reproduction. Okay, so I wanna return to this notion that I just zipped through in which uh, coanoflagellates have this rich and diverse life history. And it turns out that much of that life history, this, the jumps between the different life history stage is actually controlled by cues from the environment, either bacterial lipids, 
physical confinement, or two different types of cues that can induce mating. And we've been curious to understand how this is actually regulated at a genetic level, because understanding the genetics of these life history transitions will help us to understand whether they are homologous or shared ancestry with developmental processes in animals. Okay, so that's the sort of starting point of, uh, of what I wanna tell you about today. So if you were to go after um, uh, understanding this, what you wanna do is figure out which genes actually allow quantifiblets to sense and integrate these signals. Um, and this is where uh, a, um, a really wonderful postdoc, Alan Garcia de los Bayanos steps in. Um, and he decided to take this question head on. And he particularly focused on a group of candidate receptors that we've been interested in for a very long time, but haven't had the molecular tools available to study. These are a group of molecules called GPCRs or G protein coupled receptors. And these are fascinating receptors because they are um, essential for many important developmental processes in animals. Um, they sit in the membrane itself and they integrate cues from the environment or the extracellular milieu of an animal cell into important intracellular signals that then signal downstream uh, to uh, change transcriptional profiles and other uh, aspects of the cell biology. And, th and they're particularly interesting to us in the context of quantiflagellates because they respond to things like light, um, uh, uh, various amino acids, um, and even lipids. So they were a, a good candidate for understanding how bacteria might regulate um, multicellularity. And so Alan decided to really focus on trying to understand the evolution of GPCRs and trying to interrogate their function in coanaflagellates. And for reasons that will become clear in a moment, I hope, um, he focused on this particular uh, adhesion GPCR, which actually we've named Cupidon, and I forgot to change it on this uh, slide. So you might see a few places where it says clumpy, but it's cupidon, which, uh, and the reason for that I hope will become clear. So this is what it looks like. Um, cupidon has uh, a series of extracellular motifs that are common in diverse uh, receptors and, or, and adhesion proteins. It has seven transmembrane passes, which make it part of this uh, GPCR family. And um, in particular, it has this diagnostic GPS domain which is an um, autocatalyzed proteolytic cleavage site, which actually separates this portion of the protein from this one in terms of covalency, but, um, but often they remain attached in terms of the way they function. And, uh, and through work uh, by David Booth, we are now able to do uh, CRISPR gene editing. And so Alan edited this protein um, or edited the gene in two places, one that cleaved in the laminin G domain and one that cleaved uh, much further toward the uh, five prime end so that there were only 95 amino acids. And it, in some cases, I'm gonna show you results from both, but I think the important take home is that both of these truncations yielded the same results relative to the full length. Okay, so the first question then is, is this uh, protein necessary for growth and, extra, and just viability? And it turns out that if you compare the cell density shown here on the y-axis um, over time between the control and the two cupidon uh, mutants, what I hope you can see is that there's absolutely no difference. So deletion of, these, uh, uh, of this gene does not disrupt cell proliferation. So, um, so that's an interesting and important first observation. Now, the second question of course is, uh, this is an adhesion GPCR, we hypothesized that it was likely to have an important role in uh, rosette development. And so Alan then studied that, and he studied it by looking at um, first wild type cells and the presence or absence of bacterial sulfonolipids um, to see if they form rosettes. And then he did the same experiment with Cupidon. So here you can see a control experiment in which these unicellular wild type uh, S rosetta are incubated either with a buffer heaps or with outer membrane vesicles from the algorophagus bacteria. And these cont contain the sulfonolipids we told you about. And what I hope you can see is that the wild type cells are forming these beautiful rosettes 
And we can measure those by measuring the area, as you can see on the y-axis, and here's the control versus the OMBs. Now, when he did the same experiment with Cupidon, um, I have to say we were both surprised because it seemed that there was no effect. Um, so here's the Cupidon mutant here on the left, grown with heaps, grows perfectly well. And we added OMVs, they formed beautiful little rosettes. And you can see when he quantified this, that there was absolutely no difference in terms of the, um, the size of the rosettes. So in fact, this defied our expectation. And it looks like Cupidon does not... Um, uh, play an important role in regulating multicellularity in this organism. So if not that, then what? What does it do? Um, and this is where things got exciting. So what Elon found was that uh, if he looked at these live cultures, what he saw was that wild type uh, cells um, in, in rich media uh, look perfectly normal and happy swimming around. But when he looked at the cupidon cells, what he saw was in fact that they formed these large aggregates. And hopefully this is starting to ring some bells because I just told you that it, uh, during mating, coanoflagellates aggregate. So, um, so we, the next step was Alan was wondering, what are these clumps? Well, well, just to be very clear, they are not rosettes. They are uh, aggregates. And so um, we're not looking at this rosette development process. We're trying to understand what's the nature of these clumps. And so just as a reminder then, whether regardless of whether you induce mating by adding bacterial uh, Vibrio Fisher IQs like arrows, or you grow the colanoflagellates in lo low nutrient media, both processes involve a transition through a clumpy aggregated state. Um, and so that's what this looks like in this uh, life history diagram. There's a clumpy state that unites both of these, but then they follow different paths, one undergoing anisogamy and the other undergoing isogamy, and they fuse in different ways. And so um, uh, Alan asked whether the cupidon or clumpy mutants were actually mating. And the first way he did this was to actually characterize carefully the nature of aggregation in cupidon versus starved wild type versus uh, wild type cells that had been treated with uh, cues from arrows. And, um, and to do this, he, uh, he essentially parameterized how, uh, how he was measuring this with either measuring whether cells were contacting at their cell bodies collar, collar, as you can see in teal here, or um, magenta, in which is cell body contact to the collar. And so this, these are the results. Here's cupidon on the left, starved wild type in the middle, and uh, wild type cells that have been treated with arrows from Vibrio fisheri here on the right. And what I hope you can see right off the bat is that the cupidon and wild type cells are most similar and that they, um, uh, primarily interact with adjacent cells, either through collar cell body interactions or through collar collar interactions. And this is quite different from the Eros aggregates in which most of the contacts are cell body, cell body. And so what he hypothesized was that um, since these cells, the, both the cupid, cupidon mutant cells and the starved wild type cells were aggregating through their collar, that if he were to disrupt the structure of the collar, that he might disrupt, disrupt clumping and mating. And so this is an experiment he did in which he treated cells either, whoops, with, I'm sorry, either with uh, a control substance, DMSO, or with a drug, latrunculin A, that shortens the collar. And so hope you can see that the, the collar here is still quite long, whereas in these latrunculin A cells, they're quite short. Um, and uh, what he found was that in uh, these treated cells now, uh, you can see that when the wild type cells are starved, the, um, the size of the clump is very small. In Eros cultures, where they're clumping in response to Vibrio fisheri now, he saw no difference or even an enrichment in clumping uh, when the cells were treated with latrunculin A. So is... Uh, is the cupidon mutant going to be more like the starved cells or the aerostel cells? And in fact, they behave more like the starved cells in which when treated with latrunculin A, they stop forming these clumps. 
So this all raised the question of how is Cupidon acting and how is it mediating uh, this transition from being isolated to being uh, um, aggregative? And so he developed a new technique that allowed him to uh, tag the protein um, in vivo and look at where it's localizing. And this, these are very early results. Um, but what Alon found was that in cells that had been, uh, that were expressing Cupidon with a tag, he could detect it at the collar, as I hope you can see here. Um, so this is the collar and in the merge, you can see that Cupidon is specifically localized to the collar. Um, and in further studies that he's been doing, um, uh, he's found that the localization is actually at the base of the collar, which is where we actually get cell fusion. And so this suggests that Cupidon somehow might be mediating those interactions and that its absence is allowing cells to fuse, whereas its presence is somehow inhibiting it. Okay, so his results so far actually um, indicate that Cupidon might be regulating mating and in particular might be regulating the type of mating that's induced by low nutrient conditions. He sees that cells are aggregating. He sees that uh, the Cupidon is actually localized to the collar. Um, and then he wanted to know whether cells are actually fusing in these mutant cultures. So um, here, what, he, uh, what I'm gonna show you is a study in which he took these um, cells and actually either labeled them with one fluorescent protein, MTFP in this case, or a second one, M-cherry. And so you can see these cells can be distinguished from each other by their color. Um, and he did the same with uh, cupidone mutant cells, um, which you can see here and here. So you have clumps of uh, uh, cupidone with green or, and clumps with magenta, and then he, either mixed these wild type cells or mixed these mutant cells for 20 hours and asked what percentage of uh, cells at the end of this had both fluorophores. And those that had both, um, we inferred were the product of cell fusion. So here's one example in which you can see the um, DIC image of this cell, uh, the green, whoops, the magenta or the fused cell. And um, and when he did, I'm sorry, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. this morning and take my son to a high school event. <laughs> I'm a little tired. I apologize. Okay, so when this is quantified, um, uh, what you can see is that there along the y-axis we're seeing the percentage of fused cells, um, and here we're control we're comparing the number of fused cells in a uh, control experiment versus those in a mutant culture. And what I hope you can see is that there's a, um, a five-fold increase in the number of fused cells in the mutant versus the wild type. And so all of this is very consistent with the process of mating. So the next thing Alon did was to look at um, the profile of uh, transcribed genes in mutant cells versus wild type cells. Um, and so here, um, what I hope you can see, each of these dots is a different gene. Um, and these dotted lines are the, um, the cutoff or the threshold that he applied in terms of identifying those that were upregulated, those that seemed relatively unchanged, and those that were downregulated. And so you can see that there are certainly are differences between Cupidon and the control. There's um, a, a small number of cells that are specifically upregulated and even smaller number that are downregulated. Um, and I hope you see that these are different colors and you might be thinking, oh, well, the green ones are colored green because they're upregulated and these are, um, you know, salmon because they're downregulated. But in fact, they're colored by whether they are upregulated in starved wild type cells or downregulated in starved wild type cells. And so what this shows is that the genes that are different between Cupidon and the control are also different in uh, starved wild type cells versus unstarved cells. So there's convergence in the transcriptional profile uh, between the mutant and the way that wild type cells behave when starved. And so this transcriptional profile also points to Cupidon cells um, has somehow taking on this uh, mating phenotype. And so 
what we now think uh, is that cupidon, far from being an adhesion mediator, is a negative regulator of sex in S. rosetta. So we now know that this protein sits at the base of the collar here in wild type S. rosetta cells. And in the presence of high nutrients, the activity of this uh, regulator actually shuts down or inhibits sex genes, genes that might promote uh, the switch from being asexual to sexual. It shuts down collar adhesion and it shuts down cell fusion. And this allows S. rosetta to persist in a vegetative growth state. When cupidon is knocked out or disrupted, even under high nutrient conditions, this blocks the inhibitory activity of cupidon, and this allows the sex genes, the collar adhesion genes and the cell fusion genes to get turned on, pushing S. rosetta into a sexual reproduction state. So this says to us that in fact, this sexual state is a default state that has to be actively inhibited by cupidon. And so this then raises the question of what's happening in starvation states with S. rosetta, where we know that these genes get turned down, collar adhesion is, uh, is no longer blocked, and cell fusion is no longer blocked. What happens to cupidon? We hypothesize that cupidon is somehow um, either degraded or, uh, or inhibited, and Alana is pursuing experiments to try to answer that question right now. Um, but I think uh, when you think about the evolution of animals, it's interesting to think about how the switch from somatic cells to gametes uh, might have been regulated. And while this particular gene is not conserved between coanoflagellates and animals, um, relatives of this gene are, and um, many of the downstream genes are conserved. So, uh, so we're very excited to take this um, these results from the laboratory and start thinking about uh, what it tells us about the origin of mating and the evolution of gametes on the animal stem lineage. Okay, with that, I will thank the lovely members of my laboratory, um, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Nicole. That was great. Uh... Thank you. Okay, so we now have the gallery of people. So one thing I uh, specified before is that it would be great when you ask a question or make a comment that you say very quickly who you are, um, your name, and uh, whether you're a biologist, a medical doctor, a philosopher, because of course that will help Nicole uh, answer your question. Um, I see that the first question is by someone who doesn't need any introduction, Scott Gilbert. Scott. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Thank you for that fantastic talk. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, since you mentioned, you know, the, uh, you know, the GCPRs, if there's any, uh, any activation of cyclic AMP or, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it brings to mind slime molds, you know. Fantastic question. Um, in fact, Alan has so many interests. So I should say that when he first knocked out Cupidon, um, we really didn't know what it was doing. Uh, there are other conditions under which coanoflagellates clump uh, that I didn't talk about. Um, and so he didn't really know what was going on. So he started actually by looking at the transcriptional profile. And one of the interesting things is that many of the genes that are differentially expressed are actually involved in cyclic GMP signaling. Um, and so he did a long series of experiments that sort of um, concerned cyclic GMP signaling. And it turns out, and actually Alana is on this call also, so he can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, when he adds cyclic G so what he sees is that cyclic GMP levels go down in the mutant and when he adds cyclic GMP, it actually uh, breaks the aggregation behavior. And that's, if I remember correctly, not only true in the mutant, but also true during mating in S. rosetta. And so there seems to be an important connection between cyclic GMP signaling and the aggregative behavior associated with mating in S. rosetta. So it's not cyclic GMP, but it's 
Yeah, yeah. You know, an analogous pathway, yeah. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yeah. This is fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from Bertrand Daignan Fournier. Bertrand Daignan Fournier, I'm a biologist, and uh, uh, I was totally fascinated by the, the fact that uh, uh, these uh, kind of flagellates could both uh, mate through uh, an isogamy and an uh, isogamy. Uh, uh, first, I was wondering whether there were other examples, and second, <laughs> um, I was wondering if you knew anything more about the process that leads to an isogamy or uh, isogamy depending on the pro well it seems to me that they all are products of the meiosis and uh, and uh, at what point do they differ and and do you have any clue in why they do so oh i i think there's so much to learn here we have no idea what regulates whether they uh you know why they follow this uh, anisogamy pathway in one case and isogamy in the other. I should say that the timeline is very different. So the starvation pathway leads to mating over a period of days or weeks, whereas the uh, induction uh, by Vibrio takes a matter of hours. Um, so that, you know, in fact, the Vibrio induced mating, there's not time really. In both cases, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I was going to say that the cells are actually transdifferating, transdifferentiating, but I, we don't know that in the case of starvation. Um, so we really don't know how those cells are coming to be. Um, and this whole thing fascinates me. I, I don't know of an example of an organism that does both, um, but we're still sifting through the literature. And if any of you know, we're happy to <laughs> learn about it. Um, I suspect, as with all things, that the, the harder we look, we'll find other examples, but maybe people just haven't documented it yet. And why would you do one versus the other? You know, again, probably here I wave hands, you know, ecological constraints, but um, I don't really know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next Hello. question by Alo. Hi, thank you, Thomas. Um, <clears throat> hi, Nicole. I'm a hi. biologist who through some long process have become this philosopher type person and I started life in B subtlest. Oh and, great. <laughs> right. And so I have a philosopher of science kind of question. Okay. Y you are a strange, I mean your lab is a strange organism because you're trying to hold a phenomena that happened uh -huh. in this vast temporal zone of evolution through a contemporary yes. species. Right. right? And this particular work that you've just shown through this cell cell signaling, the um, interesting molecule that looks a lot like many other quorum sensing molecules and the GPCR pathway kind of pressures that anachronism that you are cultivating, right? Because this pathway is already there. So if you're gonna look at coanoflagellates as a model system for asking this, deep historical evolutionary question of how did this get invented? It forces the question, these pathways are already there. The cyclic GMP is there, the GPCR is there. So how do you now push your phenomenal biological yeah. agenda into this familiar pathways? Yes, that's a great question. And, and this is something that we wrestle with a lot. I, I think that, uh, we are constrained to only make interpretations about phenomena that are conserved between coanoflagellates and animals because coanoflagellates are not the ancestors of animals. They are the product of the same time span of evolution. So um, we don't have another example of an organism that is more closely related to animals uh, than coanoflagellates are. And so this is the best we can do. Um, so I, I often, you know, you'll see people in the literature saying, well, this thing is missing from coanoflagellates, so it must have evolved on the stem lineage. And that might be the case, but it might have been lost from coanos also. Um, okay, so how do we get more specific mechanistic insight? Well, I actually, 
I suspect that there will be differences between cholanoflagellates and animals. Um, and I think maybe a good example is a, another recent piece of work that we've done on a transcription factor called RFX, um, which is a regulator of ciliogenesis in animals. And it's a regulator of cell cycle in fungi. Um, and, uh, and we know that in animals, it's typically acting in concert with another transcription call, a factor called FOXJ1. Um, in coanoflagellates, we see that it regulates ciliogenesis. So that we infer uh, was true in their last common ancestor. Um, and so that connection between this transcription factor and this important uh, cellular process is more ancient than was previously realized. But FOXJ1, although being regulated by RFX, seems to have no role in ciliogenesis. And so here's an example in which we have partial conservation, but not complete. And I don't know what to think about it. Um, I think, you know, until we study more diverse coanoflagellates and understand the nature of the interactions between, and, you know, how well conserved it is across coanoflagellate diversity, I'm not sure how to interpret that difference. So I hope that uh, that's sort of where we are. I have a question which is more focused on the extent to which you're also trying in your lab to, for example, find if there's some equivalence of, uh, for example, a bacterium being important for um, mating in in plants, for example. And the, and the reason for that would be to never exclude the fact that we're talking about something with, which is more like a convergence or something which is more general than what we had right. in the first place. So are you also trying to do that or it's just too difficult to uh, you know to try and see everywhere what's what's going on and make these comparisons? I I love that idea. Um we're not studying plants. I mean uh you know I'm really my goal is to make quantiflagellates uh, experimentally tractable system for the community. Um, but I would not be surprised if bacteria are influencing mating in plants. I think, you know, most of what we're studying in animals has been discovered in plants long ago. Um, and uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's already work showing that. Um, I think the surprise for us was that a close relative of animals was responsive to bacteria in this way. Um, and that and that you could get these dramatic shifts in life history, multicellularity, mating, who knows what else. Uh, it seems to be, you know, I, <laughs> I think of it as offshoring, you know, they've let organisms in the environment take control of their life history in a way. Um, and the bacterial example is really interesting because it's, uh, it turns out that it's an enzyme that's secreted by the bacteria. And that enzyme is actually also encoded in the coanoflagellate, but it's a dying gene. It's accumulating mutations, uh, and so it looks like it's no longer necessary that all of the switch from being uh, asexual to sexual through this pathway is now being regulated by bacteria, not by their endogenous gene. Yeah, it's been outsourced, so to speak. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, very, very, very interesting. Scott. Yeah, I, this is a bit of a side question, but, uh, you know, it used to be such an easy story to go from coanoflagellates to sponges with their... Yes. Uh, Coanocytes. Uh, yes. Now it looks like the sponges are not as basal as we had thought. Uh, is is there anything that uh, is an is is there a nice link between uh, you know the uh, tenophores or anything? Yeah, I mean, I should say that I I think the jury is still out, um, mm -hmm. and we have a, a review uh, that I just wrote with a postdoc in the lab, uh, Jacob Steenwick. And it's a, it, we just put it up, it's a preprint, re-examining the Sentiny data. Uh, so for those of you who are not in the know here, so there are two lineages that are um, in contention for being the earliest branching lineage of animals. The sponges, which have been historically favored because um, they have the filter feeding behavior of uh, coanoflagellates, the outgroup, they have a simple biology that sort of reflects what you would expect because they lack neurons and muscles and you know things that typify uh, bilaterians. Um, Tenophores 
have neurons and they have muscles and they have complex behavior. Uh, for those who don't know what they are, they sort of, they're jelly-like organisms that swim around in the water column um, and they are carnivorous. Uh, they eat other animals. And so that, I don't think anyone initially would have thought of them as a potentially early branching lineage, you know, not least of which is that there were no animals to eat, <laughs> uh, no other animals to eat. So uh, how could tenophores be the earliest branching lineage if they only eat other animals? Um, that said, some fairly compelling uh, phylogenomic studies have uh, have been arguing that coenoflag sorry tenophores are in fact the earliest branching lineage. But there are other uh, ones that argue for sponges. And so this is sort of this ongoing debate. Um, a, a paper came out recently that was, um, the people thought, oh, this settles it. But I think under, after more examination of the data, I think we still have to be cautious in interpreting which one is the earliest branch. So getting back to the question of what does this all mean for the nature of the first uh, animal. I don't know what to do with tenophores. Um, uh, I, I, I can live with the idea that sponges are degenerate something or other that have lost everything. Um, and I think, again, we just have to lean heavily on the commonalities. You know, when we can infer true homology between coanoflagellates and animals, then we learn something meaningful. And where we see differences, we have to be agnostic. Um, and so, that's that's sort of where I stand. <laughs> okay, that, uh, so your your paper is online now. It's uh yeah, it's on preprints.org and it's in review right now. So oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I hope I hope it gets settled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bertrand, uh, we have another question by Bertrand. Question about uh, rosettes. Uh, I was yeah. wondering whether there was a, a, an upper limit for the size of the rosette and, and whether this process was regulated or not. Yes. Um, I think <laughs> yes and no. So uh, in the lab, we do see stereotypical sizes, but those sizes seem to be regulated by the growth conditions. Um, so it does seem that, you know, under condition A, they will max out at something like eight cells, but under growth condition B, they max out at something like 16 cells. Uh, and who knows what it looks like in the environment. So, um, so yes, it seems to be regulated. It, it, the regulation seems to be at the level of the stiffness of the extracellular matrix. Um, if you actually soften the extracellular matrix, it allows the colony to get bigger. Um, and, uh, I imagine that there's a trade-off there where at some point the ECM is so soft that you lose the integrity of the rosette, but we have not actually played with that so much yet. Are there other questions or comments on Nicole's talk? I was also thinking that maybe if some of you were eager to ask a specific question on multicellularity and, you know, and, and maybe this is also possible to ask your question to, to uh, Nicole King now. Um, yeah. Gerd and Stuart, I'm sorry I didn't talk about multicellularity, <laughs> but actually I'm hoping to visit uh, maybe next year and maybe I can talk about multicellularity then. <laughs> Yes. Um, no, no, but you did, in fact, talk about my <laughs> uh, a little bit. And, and I was wondering whether you would agree that um, this perspective you're describing is one potential pathway uh, towards uh, multicellularity, because there are many, aren't there? Um, right. um, um, which would be environmentally induced mating um promotion yes. so to speak and the environment yeah. be the bacteria um would you agree to that yes i think actually you know that gives me a good excuse to talk about more generally what i think is going on which is that the coenoflagellates while we can't infer that what they do is what the ancestor of animals did they tell us that uh 
you can have a, a rich life history in which the transitions are controlled by the environment. And I think what's interesting about animals is that you get all those life history transitions hardwired into the genome. I mean, of course, animal development is also influenced by the environment, but not to the same extent as what we see in Chlanoflagellus. And so I, th I imagine uh, that the, the, the origin of animals involved in some level taking these cell differentiation modules that were responsive to environmental cues and instead hooking them up in some way that was regulated by transcri transcriptional cascades, you know, signaling pathways that were encoded in the genome. Um, and uh, and that's, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. How do you move from this life history that is reversible, uh, highly dynamic, responsive to, uh, you know, ever-changing environmental cues to one that goes in order throughout the developmental process that we see in animals. Um, so that's sort of how I think about that. Uh, Nicole, yeah. I'm adding on your chat only a question coming from immunologist Jean-François Moreau, who is online, but I guess he cannot ask his question right now. Sure. So do you want to take that uh, one? Yes. Okay. So the question is when... As Rosetta becomes clumpy, um, do they transcribe some genes that encode something like an extracellular matrix? Um, they express extracellular matrix genes throughout their life history. Uh, and I don't remember if there's anything specific or unusual in the, uh, you know, in this transition to being clumpy. Uh, I, Nothing comes to mind. Um, Alon, again, is online. He can tell me if I'm wrong, but um, yeah, I don't think that's the story. Yeah, all what I can say is that we look at the ECM in the mutant and uh, it doesn't seem that the sugar are, are changed at the surface of a cell. But we know that in other aggregative context, uh, uh, ECM can be modified and uh, you know lead to this aggregation behavior. It doesn't seem to be the case for the mutant, yeah. There you go, from the expert. <laughs> and Jean-Francois says, thank you. But strangely enough, he says, thank you to me. So no, so that's- Okay, the, thank it's all you good. To, to, to <laughs> um, is there any other questions? I don't see more questions. And again, that was a fantastic talk that was very, very good to see what was really going on at the moment in the lab. That was very, very exciting and full of interesting uh, questions and conceptual considerations. So, yeah. Uh, oh, I see something from Stuart. Uh, oh, great. A link to an interesting paper. So, ah, okay. great. I will, okay. I will take a look at that. Cool, cool. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a great talk. And thank you very much for excellent Q&As. Uh, thank you also for waking up so early in the morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My son needs to thank me for that. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much and have a great day. Uh, and bye-bye, everyone. That was great. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everybody.